Before I start, I want to say, I agreed with her about three years ago, our, our art was quickly vanishing, but I'm happy to say that I have two apprentices that are in their 20s right now, and there's, they're not Italian, well one is, one's half Italian, but they're young American guys who basically fell in love with handmade clothing and the art of it. And we're seeing it all over America right now. In America. Not in China. We're seeing it in America. So, you know, is I want it, you to know how important that is. And is please. The, art, the culture of the clothing or, or tailoring? It's the romance and the tailoring. And it is like these young men that are doing, uh, again, handmade luggage on the East Coast. Uh, I just bought a vintage piece of luggage uh, yesterday in Crocodile that was made by the William O. Headley and Son Company in Camden, New Jersey, in eight, about just around the turn of the century. And there's guys doing that again. So I, I, I wanted to preface my talk by saying, we used to say we had a dying art, and now I think we just have a really bad cough. So <laughs> I'm hoping we survive because it's all these young guys that are not only dressing, but they want to learn the art. So there might be some hope. <clears throat> but there's also guys that want to make wooden boats again. So, I mean, we could all be in like Flynn again. So, uh, I, I, I only brought that up uh, so I could tell you, um, my name is John DeCarl. Um, I'm a second generation custom tailor and I am Italian through and through. I dream of fast cars. I, I dream of faster women. I dream of Riva boats on Lake Como, beautiful wood on the, on, the, on the water. I dream of Italian cinema, Italian food, as you can see from my ample girth, and, and all those things, but not necessarily in that order. Uh, I want to say the faster women, and I can because my wife's not here tonight, and <laughs> my best friends are here, and they're sworn to secrecy, so <laughs> I'm safe. Um, but... Um, I tell you all of this because one day in college, this blonde guy, I was maybe a junior in college, he was kind of a pseudo-intellectual, 
I always had on this battered corduroy jacket and well-worn khakis that were well beyond their expiration date. And uh, he kind of had designs on my girlfriend. So we'd get into these arguments with me or discussions. And one day it got a little heated. And uh, his great insult, this great intellectual said, you're an ethnocentric snob. And you know, I kind of looked at him and said, I understand. What's your point? And thank you very much. I mean, I am. I just who I am. I love everything Italian. And uh, I think that's why we have this series. I think it's, there's a lot to be said for the culture in Italy, England, Sweden, Norway, everything. Uh, we just, you know, and I think people are, are, are uh, hungering for that in America. And I got the girl, by the way, because I looked snappier than him. Uh, my father, Silvio De Carlo, came to America from Calabria in the south of Italy at the age of 16 in 1935. He was a full-fledged tailor at 16 because he started when he was in the equivalent of the third grade. Um, most of the great tailors, we, right now it's very c common to say they're all from Naples. Uh, that's a great PR story in many respects. Uh, the truth is all the great tailors in the north came from Calabria or Sicily or Abruzzi. Brioni is in Abruzzi. Um, and they became tailors simply because of the fact that it was a very rugged landscape and uh, their economic woes and, and all of that. And uh, they learned a trade and then they eventually moved and became the famous tailors that we know of in Milano or Florence or, you know, all in Rome. Um, so the Neapolitans are having their day right now, but the true history of tailoring is really in the South. Um, and I think what Italians have brought to clothing is most Italians are Anglophiles and most English people are Italophiles. And they say the Italians really do the English look better than the English now because they softened it and they deconstructed it. The, the English suit uh, is very stiff with minor exceptions. Uh, it could, my dad used to say it, it, you could, didn't even need a hanger. You could just hang it on the floor and it would stand up. Uh, and the Italians took a lot of that stiffness out of it. Um, I've been in business in Seattle since 1988, and I have to say, the first question I hear uh, from people if they've come into my shop or if I meet them anywhere in the world, um, and I don't want to pick on you, but the first thing they all say is, how the hell have you made it in Seattle, the worst dressed city in the world? And. Uh, my plan was to pick on a bunch of you tonight, so I hope you take it in my good humor because uh, I think we can learn that way. Uh, so don't be taken aback because uh, I want to have fun while we're here. I always say when someone leaves our shop and we sold them something, often, most often they thank me and I'm thinking, why are you thanking me? But they say, because this was so much fun. And I say, you know, you're kind of right. I should charge a cover and a two drink minimum. This was kind of fun, you know? So. We want to educate you, but we also want you to have fun. Um, so, if I pick on a couple of you, I kind of want you to think of me as kind of combination Don Rickles and, uh, I don't know, Richard Lewis and Triumph the Insult Dog, okay? So, it's all in good humor. Uh, it's kind of like my friend Mike here. Most people, by the way, are afraid to go to dinner with me because <laughs> they call first and say, you know, they say, um, how, how am I supposed to dress for dinner tonight? Well, clearly most of you didn't call me tonight because I don't see a lot of you dressed up for a talk about Italian dressing, but that's okay. We're going to fix that before the night's over. Um, even my 20-year-plus customer, Ken Peterson, did not wear a suit tonight. <laughs> or my neighbor, Bill, but that's okay. But my friend Mike, my best friend, who usually I always call him and say, Make sure you don't embarrass me when we go to dinner on my birthday. Is wearing a suit, a sport jacket from my store that he hates because it fits him. <laughs> but he looks like a million dollars. And he looks great for 85, don't you think, folks? I mean, look at him. He's 85 years old. He's got this young wife. He looks fabulous. So, but seriously, a few points need to be established. There are indeed a few rules in dressing well. The second point is one, one, once one has a grasp of those rules, 
then you can attempt to break a rule or two. And when you do that, you will hopefully achieve what has been written about for many years, the elusive sprezzatura, which in Italian sort of means studied nonchalance. Okay? And uh, the word came to prominence in, I think, the 1400s or the 1500s. Count Baldassare Castiglioni wrote the book of the Cordier, and uh, he spoke about it. Sprezzatura is taking your pocket hank and casually putting it in your pocket and not worrying about it. Because everyone that comes to my shop says, how do I fold that pocket square? Do I, do I, do, do I, do, how do I fold it? And I say, there's no right way. You just kind of relax and take a tranquilizer and put it in your pocket and everything's going to be okay. Well, what about the corners? Well, I don't know. I don't know. What about the corners? Or, don't worry about it. That's prezzatura. You know, I don't know if anybody's noticed, but maybe my, the, the smaller part of my tie is longer than the, the larger, wider end. Sprezzatura. <laughs> the greatest dresser in the world was John Agnelli, who was the chairman of uh, Fiat and Ferrari. And uh, he used to wear his hiking boots with his beautiful double-breasted gray flannel suits. And it just was amazing, and it worked. Or he wore a V-neck sweater, but he would flip his tie out side of the V-neck sweater. It looked amazing. Um, so it's all these little rules you need to know first, and then you can slowly break them. Um, rule number, here, here's something that's really, really important, is that being wealthy and, and, and buying the most expensive clothes does not make you well-dressed. If that were true, there'd actually be a well-dressed Russian billionaire. And, and there's no such thing. Um, and I say that for a reason. Or a Saudi prince. I mean, you see, they're, they're just, they're, they buy expensive, to own a few quality pieces. <laughs> and so it's just, it's, it's not enough to have beautiful clothes. Many people have beautiful clothes. Some people have way too many clothes. Uh, it's important how you assemble the clothing. And then wear the separate items collectively. Fit is also paramount. I always tell my clients, when I'm done with you, you'll look two inches taller and 10 pounds thinner. And they love that. And uh, I think we, we achieve it. We try to achieve it. I think we do a fairly good job. Uh, we fail a few times, but uh, we're not dressing a size 38 regular male model who weighs 100 pounds, like you see on the runways. We're dressing real men. And that's why when you see these pictures in these books of all these great looking Italian guys, they're not perfect specimens. The greatest lover of all was Marcello Mastriani. He smoked 60 cigarettes a day. He had yellow teeth. He had a paunch. He never took any exercise. And when he was in his 60s, he could take his glasses off and look at a young starlet. And she was in his trailer in a half an hour. So it's not about being perfect. It's about knowing how to pull it off. And nobody pulled it off like Marcello Mastriani. I think he's probably still doing it, and he's dead. <laughs> That's how good he was at it. So, I, I think a lot of dressing well, curiously, comes from um, the immigrant mentality, too. Uh, uh, it's not just the CEO of the largest software companies. It's... Uh, if, if, if you were raised in an immigrant family of any nationality, you're well aware of all these black and white pictures of people on the boats or recently arrived from their country. And they look incredibly elegant. My grandfather looked like better than anybody who dresses today. He worked on the railroad. There are pictures on our website of him that will blow you away, him with his brothers. Um, but, you know, they had a dignity about them. But if you look at those pictures up close, they're all wearing handmade suits that were made by the village tailor. And if you look even closer, their luggage is leather, and it was handmade in that same village. And it was probably the only good suit of clothes they had. But they wore it with pride, and it lasted, and they took care of it. And we see that, and today, when we sell something, we say to someone, or, or our customers say to us, you know the problem, John? I don't need any more clothes. Your clothes don't wear out. Well, that's great. I mean, but 
we're in a business where we don't have planned obsolescence. It'd be a great way to, I'd love to know how to market that, but you know, HP sells you a computer or a printer and it's toast in two years. And we go and we buy a new one. You buy a handmade or a well-made suit or a well-made pair of work boots from White Shoes because uh, you work construction and they'll be good in 20 years. That's money well spent. So not everyone has to be wealthy to pull it off. It's all about buying a few quality pieces and making them work for you. So, it's very important if you'll notice, uh, for example, with regard to Italian style or European style, let's call it European style, fashion falls out of favor. Style is timeless. Um, everyone has their moment on the front pages where they're selling a skinny short suit and flood pants like Tom Brown's doing right now. But he's not going to be around in a year because A, real men can't wear those clothes. And can you hear me back there? You can? Okay. So just remember, style and fashion are not synonymous. So am I going too long? Okay. Am I doing okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, so how does a gentleman achieve style and assemble a proper timeless wardrobe? Let's start with the suit. Rule number one, guys. No black suits. No black suits. Ladies, you get a pass. You understand how to wear black with gray and other things. Guys, we have a saying in my store. I'm going to clean it up for the tape. Any expletive can wear a black suit. Starts with an A. <laughs> but it takes elegance and elan to wear a deep charcoal suit, and I'll tell you why. The charcoal suit is infinitely more versatile than a black suit. Black goes with white, goes with maybe purple, maybe some green. Charcoal goes with everything. You can't wear brown shoes with a black suit. You can wear brown suede shoes with a charcoal suit. The foundation of any gentleman's wardrobe in Italy or Europe Anywhere is a charcoal suit and a deep navy suit. Pick one, get both. I've got eight navy suits. I love navy suits. I love charcoal suits. Uh, it's just much, much more practical. And uh, according to my friends, my hair is about 10% gray. Is that right? What are you laughing at? Um, OK, so anyway, so charcoal is a nice color with hair that's starting to gray. But uh, I'm just telling you, forget the black suit. We'll sell you one under duress. But I, to, I would wear a charcoal or a deep navy suit. When Johnny Agnelli died, everyone was in charcoal and navy suits. No one was in black. And I'll tell you why Italians rarely wear black, and they don't wear black shoes. We wear black shoes when we get married, and we wear black shoes when we're buried. And the reason is we kind of think they're both the same thing. But no, just get up, just kidding. No, but really it's true. On your wedding day, you wear striped trousers with black shoes. And, but by and large, no, it's rare. It's very, very rare. Um, a navy or a charcoal suit is going to take you through the day. Your best business meeting with a suit and tie that evening. And this is where Europeans get it. Italians, French, English get that whole notion of the suit as sportswear. You go home or you have it at the office, a nice lightweight cotton lyle turtleneck or a cashmere and silk turtleneck uh, with that double-breasted navy suit and all of a sudden you're ready for a nightclub. You're ready to go out and, you know, and just have a great time and that suit should be just as comfortable as your jeans. You've taken the tie off maybe. Really, the tie and the shirt should be comfortable, too. But you might want a softer feel for when you go out later that night. Uh, I mentioned the navy suit. I have at least four or five in my closet, and it drives my wife crazy. Um, but most designers wear navy, too. Giorgio Armani is always in navy, never in black. He even wears navy sweatsuits with white tennis shoes. Everybody looks great in navy. And then you can go on to all the other colors. There's cobalt blue. There's marine blue. There's so many variations on the navy blue suit that we could sell you a navy suit for 20 years and they'd all look different. 
After that, I would say you move on to striped suits, and the biggest, um, I would say, misconception about the striped suit, and I hate when people say, oh, that, that looks like a gangster suit or a mafia suit. Well, first of all, that's incredibly stereotypical and offensive if you happen to be Italian. <laughs> but more importantly, that suit is historically the apex of conservatism in England. If you go to the banking world in England, everyone is in a boldly striped, pinstripe suit. That suit you see in the movies on gangsters was a look that they affected to look like conservative English businessmen. So see, we've taken a look and changed it, and they kind of caricaturized it in the movies too. When you talk about a uh, navy blue suit, you, you're not referring to one with a subtle pinstripe in it? This is solid. I say you. I would tell you that that suit with the stripe is now strictly a business suit. By definition, today we're lucky if people take a shower and brush their teeth to go to work. So you'd wear that navy suit, and you'd be infinitely more better dressed than anyone else at the office in today's world. But technically, your navy suit or your charcoal suit maybe can have some texture. But I would say that first foundation of the wardrobe should be a solid suit or a textured suit. Again, stripes, as subtle as they may be, are technically business. That's all. Is that okay? Can anybody please feel free to jump in if you have any questions. I can handle it. Um, after that, I would say, after you get these foundations down, then you move into plaids and stripes and beautiful blue blazers and marine blue and, and all kinds of different things that you can do. I always tell people though, it's a real simple rule. If the suit or the sport coat looks a little pimpy or it looks like Herb Tarlick from WKRP in Cincinnati would wear it or uh, a guy from the NFL or the NBA or maybe a hockey announcer from Canada would wear it, I'd say don't buy it because it's going to be too loud and it's going to be too garish because it's just way, it's not going to be classic. You're, you're not going to keep it for a long, long time. So, um, blue blazer, absolutely essential. Does not have to be the traditional navy. We rarely sell a traditional navy blazer now. Everybody wants to wear Napoli blue and wool in cotton. Uh, it's kind of an azure blue. It's a great look with charcoal, medium trousers, uh, medium gray trousers. It's a great look with white trousers in the summer. It's great with blue jeans. Everybody has a love affair tonight. Everybody has a love affair with jeans, I see, with a few minor exceptions. But jeans are great. But you want to dress them up a little bit. Trousers, you cannot have enough trousers. And again, a big question I always hear is, well, can you only wear plain front trousers now or pleated trousers out? Are three-button suits out? Are double-breasted suits in or out? None of them are ever out. Some have more prominence at that time. I wear 25-year-old suits, 20-year-old suits. I'm wearing tonight the top coat that my father made 35 years ago on top of my suit. Uh, so if you like pleats, wear pleats. Just make sure you don't look like MC Hammer. Don't, make sure they're not too voluminous. Uh, and I do wear pleats and I do wear plain front trousers, both. Shirts, I would say it's important to work your way up to a dozen shirts. A guy's got to have a dozen great shirts. Six at the laundry, six at home. If you travel, maybe even more. I rarely sell white shirts. I love white shirts. But, you know, buy a few white shirts. But buy beautiful boots. Especially if you're just starting out and you can't afford a big, big wardrobe. Um... Should I touch on tuxedos or should I stop? Touch on it. Are we okay? Great. Okay. Can I take a sip of water? Yes. You're doing a fantastic job, by the way. We came to hear the opera. Uh, oh, yeah? It was, it was excellent also. But Great. You, your presentation is more succinct than can understand. Well, thanks. Thank can you. you. Sing, can you do any opera? I can. La rora di bianco vestita. <laughs> I used to sing opera. <laughs> Metien que tu la vesta bianca. Okay, that's it. Uh, 
but we're going to talk about the opera. I think if you went to the opera this evening dressed like this, or like this, or like this, or like this, in your gardening clothes, essentially, in my dad's opinion, because my father wore a suit to the grocery store. And if you're going to go to the opera, or the symphony, or the ballet, and insult those people that work so hard to put that production on and look like you're from Seattle, or like you're making an espresso on the street, look like a barista in a pair of Birkenstocks, they shouldn't let you in. They should make you stay outside with the fur people who work with the sides. You know, these people work so hard, and we insult them with our presence like that. And so, I, just a little aside there, you know. Uh, I think it's important to dress like a grown-up. And I think it's important to show respect for the people that work so hard to bring you theater and opera and this and that. And I think it's really important, which brings us to evening clothing, the formal suit. Now, my tuxedo is here. I'm going to show you something very important. Oh, Madonna mia. Um, what color is my tuxedo, folks? Once again, I'll let you have another guess. What color is my tuxedo? What color is my tuxedo? Schmucks, what color is this tuxedo? It is midnight blue, which looks more black under artificial light. The tuxedo was never black, ladies and gentlemen. It was always midnight blue. Only if you rent your tuxedo or if you buy it at the men's warehouse is it black. If you buy a four or five thousand dollar tuxedo, I'm going to make you buy Midnight Blue. <laughs> I'm not going to make you, but I'm going to suggest it. Um, if you're going to buy a tuxedo, do not buy a notch lapel tuxedo. This is a notch lapel. Can anyone, everyone see the difference between the notch and the peak? Does anyone have any questions? If you go to Brooks Brothers and buy an inexpensive tux, it will most likely have a notch lapel, which was very popular to informalize the tuxedo starting in the 40s. If you're going to spend money on an expensive tuxedo, buy a single-breasted or a double-breasted peak lapel. And I would say pleat the trousers. And make sure it's what color, folks? Thank you very much. Sorry? I would pleat the trousers because I just think, when I think of a tuxedo, um, I think of the 30s, I think of when it originally came about, when it was worn at Tuxedo Park, uh, it was a pleated trouser. Uh, I, I, I just made this same look, a white dinner jacket and a midnight blue tux for a young man, but he wanted plain front trousers. And we did it, it looks great. Um, if you're gonna do double-breasted, I, I think I should have clarified that. If you're gonna do double-breasted, definitely, I would say put a single pleat. Would the, would the original tuxedo have been double-breasted? I think it was, yeah, because <clears throat> I think it was either double-breasted shawl collar or double-breasted peak lapel. Yeah, mine right here, this one is single-breasted peak. Um, it's, and like, again, double-breasted is obviously infinitely more elegant. And you don't have to button your double-breasted tuxedo or your double-breasted suit. Unbutton it, put your hands in your pocket, relax, it's sprezzatura, which means studied nonchalance. That's what we're trying to do. So, you may. Oh, wow. I think a lady, there's a great picture. Uh, who's the girl that's married to uh, 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 Rick Okazic, the beautiful model? She's very. Paulina Portoskova and then Lauren Hutton. Wow. They're in a single breasted, all with peak lapel, single breasted, just like this. Um, I love a tuxedo on a lady with, with uh, straight trousers and no shirt, like a little camisole, or, or the, a wing collar shirt with no tie. Very sexy. 
Huh? Well, it's more shaped. Yeah, because yeah, we shape it because you guys are bumpier and we're not. And we want to see the bumps. So, I mean, <laughs> we, we want to enjoy the tuxedo too. Um, God, I'm a sexist pig, aren't I? That's why you love me. Anyway, <laughs> here's what I want to tell you all, gentlemen. Um, let's not make the mistake and follow the guys in Hollywood unless you're following George Clooney or Pierce Brosnan who wear proper bow ties with classic tuxedos. You don't want to wear a foreign hand tie with your tuxedo unless you're Ryan Seacrest. And guess what? I don't think he's getting the girls the way Ryan Pierce Brosnan, who's almost 60. And uh, what's the other guy I just said? Uh, George Clooney. Not doing too bad with the girls. Very classic. Uh, yeah, so lose the, the tie. You're basically the guy in the 70s in the powder blue tuxedo if you're wearing the four in hand tie with your tuxedo. You're gonna go back and look at that picture 20 years from now and say, why am I wearing that skinny tie with my tux? Well, yes, what dear. What about a bow tie with a, without, you know, in a regular suit, not a tuxedo? Any feelings about I, lo I think bow ties are great. We're seeing a lot of people selling them. Um, I think it's a great look. I think it's a natty look. I think it's a great professorial look. Uh, I just think it's wonderful. I don't feel comfortable for me pulling it off. I love it most my formal wear, obviously. Uh, I think it's a real dandy look. And uh, I love to see it. And I'll tell you what, it's coming back. My customers are not getting old with me. Uh, it's really amazing. They're all young guys. And they love bow ties and they love suits. Because, let's face it, they've seen their dad go to work with a backpack and a pair of dockers. The dad looked like an ass. So no matter how your dad dressed, no kid wants to dress like his father. Now, when I was a kid, I had hair down to here because I didn't want to look like my dad. Well, now your dad looks like a schmuck going to work. with a, with a he's, he's over 12 and he carries a backpack. Over 12, lose the friggin' backpack, okay? It's not right. Briefcase, gentlemen. So these young men are coming to me. They're starved for the. They're starved for clothing. They don't want to look like their father. It's aces for me. It's working out wonderfully for me. Hey, yes, sir. Where does the finest materials come from? The finest. Where do the finest materials come from? Is the question. I would say two places and two places only, and uh, well, not with minor exception, but. Um, the English and the Italians are the only people that have first class mills. The Chinese are attempting to do it. They're close. Uh, the finishes are not quite there. A lot of company. The reason a suit from that company that sells on TV, where you buy five suits for $80 and they're always on TV and their initials are Joseph A. Bank or something like that. <laughs> Those suits cost about $30, I think, to make with the fabric in China. So, and I, I happen to know. I mean, that would be an expensive one. Where in Italy is the fabric itself made? Fabrics in Italy now are only made in the north, um, near Como, and a couple other places in that region. England still has a handful of fabulous mills. The Irish still have wonderful, the best linens are still from Ireland, uh, but even that's changing. Some of those mills are becoming, they're making linens for our inner linings of our suits, uh, for canvases or sailcloth, you know, or, or industrial things. <clears throat> Italian tailors love English cloth. Uh, we really do, but we love Italian cloth too. Uh, I think the Italians do some things better. The English do some things better. Um, I love English flannel, but then again, there's two or three mills in Italy that are amazing too. So you really, they're both excellent. I'm sorry? Who does the corduroy? Corduroy, uh, Germany, some, mostly Italian and English. And then, but, but then again, there is stuff made in India. There is stuff made in China. We don't want to use it. With regard to shirtings, the English have maybe one or two mills left. The Italians have kind of taken that over. Um, there's Turkish mills. We don't like their fabrics. Uh, a lot of guys 
sell those claws and the name sounds Italian, but it's not. It's Turkish and it stretches on you. But, you know, everybody has to try to do it. Um, the Swiss make magnificent shirtings, but there's only one or two companies left. Alumo being one of them. Their prices are stratospheric. Alumo, A-L-U-M-O. They're Swiss. But, you know, to sell an Alumo shirt, it's four, or $500 and up. Fabric only, yeah. Just the mill that makes the fabrics. Yeah. And in Italy, they've kind of been all, uh, uh, how do you call it when you, uh, merged and this and that, you know. And it's funny, the Italians have bought up the names of a lot of the old English shirting mills. Like John A. Anderson, I think, was a very famous shirting company or mill in England. So the Italians have bought that name. They bought the name Thomas Mason, but the mill is Albini, which is wonderful. I need a sip of Prosecco. <laughs> Fabulous. Okay. Does anyone else want to interrupt? Go ahead. No, really, I want you to. No? Five or six hundred dollars. That doesn't mean it's going to wrinkle less. No, it, you, you no I know. You mentioned the right. But what I'm saying is it might wrinkle more, but some people might be buying that shirt for its softness, its fineness, um, it feels very silky. It, it is a thread count. It, uh, they're two by two, 200 qualities, uh, 250s, 300s. Um, but they're very silky and very soft and very delicate. But that doesn't mean you can't take that same yarn and make a very heavy, luxurious Oxford cloth shirt. I sell a shirting, uh, the fabric is sold under the Lodopiana name, the fabric house, but they don't make it. It's made by another mill in Italy. Uh, and it is basically a super heavy, luxurious Oxford cloth. But that shirt's gonna last for 10, 12 years. It's unbelievable. It's worth every nickel that you'll spend on that shirt. So, but does it have to do with the thread count or the origin of the, of the, the cotton itself? Yes. <laughs> All of those, the origin of the cotton, so what, the, what, what, the people that weave it, the way they weave it, whether it's an Oxford, a broadcloth, a zendaline, a, 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 I'm losing my thought here, a twill, you know. Um, and those are just cotton shirts. My friend Bill over here in the corner, the good looking redheaded man, is wearing a bespoke shirt from my shop. Coincidentally, I just delivered it to him. It's made in wool. It is a very nice sport coating fabric that's very lightweight. So, and I make them for his brother as well who lives in California, in LA. And we make them like dress shirts with this spread collar. And he wears them under suits. They're very light. They breathe just like cotton shirts. Uh, in fact, in many respects, a wool shirt's incredibly practical. Remember cotton? I always tell people in my store when they say, how do I care for my clothes? I say, just remember two things. Wool is smart, cotton is stupid. If we were all sitting around smoking cigars like in the good old days in a bar like this size and went home at three o'clock in the morning drunk and our wife said, don't sleep in this room, you smell like cigars. But you took that suit and hung it outside that wool suit the next day. 98% of that odor would dispel in the fresh air. That shirt would not. The cotton retains the odor which is why we need to launder those shirts and why from time to time you want to take your shirts that you take to the cleaners or the, you know, the launders home and wash them yourself as well. Get all that starch out of them and get those white shirts white again. Because, you know, they're washing your shirts with everybody else's. Kind of, yeah, you know, kind of gross. <laughs> uh, should I continue or do you want me to just give you Yes, Mike. Go ahead. <laughs> if money was not an option. If money? Was no option. Yes. Could you tell us what the top ten things are that you would put into a wardrobe considering you didn't have one? Money's no option. And a suit will consider one item. So describe ten. I mean from ten items? Yeah. I'm gonna start at the bottom. Can I start at the bottom? Like shoes, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> well, you got a dirty mind. Uh, 
I would tell you to go out and buy the best pair of shoes you can afford because I've got a pair of cheap shoes and I will give them to anybody here who wants them because I don't wear them. Buy some great shoes. I would tell you to buy, I would say for me it would be a brown suede pair of shoes. Either a monk strap or I wore these for a reason. I'm wearing half boots in kind of a, a rust shade, but I have them in chocolate brown as well. I'd buy something like that, a monk strap. I don't know that I'd buy a lace, uh, a lace up. I'd probably buy a monk strap because it can look dressy or casual. If you didn't buy brown suede, I would tell you to maybe buy a beautiful cordovan lace up or monk strap again. I'd love to have you buy the Court of Norwegian, but it might be a little too casual. So I may, maybe you need to buy one or, should we say two pair of shoes or one? You got 10. It's your 10. Okay, my 10, my 10 are a pair of brown. My, I would say you need your brown suede shoes. But we need, okay, I, I'm, we're gonna leave, we're gonna leave formal wear out of this because that's a separate thing. Uh, I'd get the brown suede shoes and then a deep ox blood shoe of your choice and style. Either lace up. I got eight left. Oh boy. Navy or charcoal suit. Does not matter. I, does that, if you want me to go there, I'd say probably single, but if it's only 10 things, yeah. Then I'd have you do a not very navy blue blazer. And when I say that, I mean marine blue or something like that. Um, then I would tell you, okay, where am I at? I think you're six left. Six, okay. Charcoal trousers in a, immediate, in a medium weight wool. A pair of really elegant, ritzy, expensive cotton trousers, khaki. Uh, we sell what we call our rich guy dockers. We sell them like crazy. I mean, they're amazing. Uh, they cost you seven, eight, nine. Some guys pay $1,500 for a pair of incredible cotton pants. But I can tell you, I'm wearing some that are 11, 12 years old. Um, I, so I'd say a great pair of khakis. Amazing pair of khakis. So we got our suit. Huh? Five left. Five left? We're halfway through. Four left. Well, we got a... Well, I guess you're going to have to leave the ties out because, uh, well, maybe not. Four shirts and a solid navy tie. I even brought one or a solid navy knit tie or maybe just a burgundy knit tie. How's that? Burgundy knit tie, charcoal trouser, khaki trouser, navy blazer. You're, you're there. You can travel the world. Yeah, what about your Yeah. What kind of outerwear? I don't know. You tell me if you, well, you tell me if, okay, 12. First thing I'd do is I would probably be really decadent and get one of these cashmeres that are really bulky and really expensive. And then I would ask you if you would wear this top coat that my father made with his own two hands, God rest his soul. And I have to show you something. I hope I don't cry. I don't want to cry, but, huh? Well, I have to tell you something. I'm just broken hearted. He used to eat these mints, and uh, I've got one wrapper left. And I lost one of the mints last week. I'm sick about it. I won't throw it away. It's a midnight blue, babe. Yeah. Now, here's my question. Here's my question, though. See how it looks now? I used to wear a coat like this with a baseball cap and jeans with my kids in the park. Okay? If you wear this double-breasted peak lapel or a single-breasted navy top coat with your baseball jack uh, hat and a pair of gloves, you're there. When I first opened, I used to sell raincoats like crazy. I haven't sold a raincoat in 15 years because, A, Seattleites are in de denial. <laughs> but number two, men are creatures of habit. 
they buy one raincoat in their life and they say, okay, I bought a raincoat, and that's the last time you ever see them again. So <laughs> if you carry them one season too long, you're stuck with 50 raincoats because there's not 50 more guys to sell them to. A top coat's far more versatile. Uh, sheep get wet, so why can't your wool top coat or cashmere top coat get wet? It'll dry out. Just don't sit at Husky Stadium all day in it, you know, for five hours. Okay, so. Thank you, sir. you No, I don't, but I look fabulous. <laughs> it's, all, it's all about, listen, here's what I do in my business. I'm going to be really honest. Most, first of all, it drives me nuts when these guys come in my shop and want to brag. They come in and they go, I don't have to dress for work anymore. And if I'm in a good mood, I, I say, well, then, then what the hell are you doing in here? Did you just come in here to brag? And you know, or I say, well, you don't have to brush your teeth or comb your hair or take a shower. What's your point, right? So my point is you have to approach men at their basis level, okay? How do I clean this up? I always say to guys when they like that, oh, I don't need, they, I don't, I need, I don't need to dress up for work. They'll make fun of me at work. And I look at them and I always ask a question that I always know the answer will be no to. I always say, are you getting all the sex you want? And I have never had anybody say, yes, I'm telling you, I've been churning it down. They all say no. And I say, come over here by the mirror. I want you to look at yourself. This may be the reason. Look at you. So, if you tell a guy that, he's going to say, you son of a bitch, I want to get laid. So he's going to buy clothes. I apologize. But the point is, you have to approach it that way. It's all about, look, you ask what I wear to a game. I'm married, but I'm always on the lookout. You never know. My wife might decide to leave me. <laughs> I'm just joking. I married the most beautiful woman. She's not Italian, but she looks Italian. She's black, Irish, fabulous. She looks like Celia Ward. Love her. Oh, very important. If you come in my shop and say, I don't wear those things in my pocket. I ain't never worn one. I say, well, then you're not completely dressed. Get a white linen, get something, but you're not properly dressed without a pocket hank. It's the icing on the cake. And what about uh, the icy match? Did someone pay you to talk so much? <laughs> Normally. Yeah. If, they, if they're the same, they look If it's the same, you look like a croupier in Las Vegas or a Saudi Arabian oil guy. You don't want to look like that. So it's okay to wear a stripe, in your opinion, a stripe and a polka dot? She mentioned uh, in, in an article once, great designer named Emmanuel Ungaro from France. He was Italian, by the way, not French. His father was a tailor, as was he. And... Uh, he was a real ladies' man, and he was... Uh, you don't want to be matchy-poo, you want to be complimentary-poo. It's very true. That's very true. <laughs> yeah, matchy-poo is like, no, it's not good. Uh, so... Can you wear a pocket square with With what? Absolutely. Absolutely. That pocket needs something in it. Absolutely. Fabulous. I'm, like a turtleneck yes, 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 pocket square, turtleneck, yes, how about this, polo shirt, classic polo shirt, blazer or sport jacket, uh, pocket square, absolutely, blue jeans, no socks, penny loafers in cordovan, pocket square. In closing, I want to say, the best way to learn about how to dress well or like an Italian, is to watch old movies. Know your tailor as well as you know your jeweler. And enjoy dressing. And for God's sake, when someone at work makes you feel uncomfortable about, uh, uncomfortable about how well you dress that day, I want you to turn to them and I want you to say that you are simply dressing your age or quite simply as a grown-up professional. Don't take any crap from those guys because you're doing the right thing, not the wrong thing. You have respect for the job. The other thing I'd say is perception and reality are two different things. 
we all know that certain software leaders in this area are known, are thought to not dress well or wash their hair or this and that. And it's not true. They have impeccable wardrobes. They know when to wear those clothes. And when they are dressed casually, they're in expensive shirts and expensive trousers and maybe not in a tie. But when you go to see the Queen of England and be knighted, you better look good. And if you work for those guys, those programmers might look like they're in front of a computer and eating Skittles and drinking Mountain Dew all day. But I got news for you, the guys upstairs, like my number one client from a company called MSoft over there, but he's not the big guy, he's another guy that just left the company. He goes in every day dressed like every day is important. And every day Steve Ballmer says the same thing and gives him a bad time and he looks at him and says, Steve, I'm a gentleman. I'm not lowering the bar for you. This is how I dress. Now let's get down to business. So if you respect yourself, don't worry about what they say at the office. And if they say that you're making everyone uncomfortable, tell them to tell them to grow up. You're an adult. I really appreciate everybody listening to me and ask me anything you want. I'm not going anywhere. What? You didn't touch on patterns. Mixing patterns, checks, uh, you know. Uh, <clears throat> I'm big on matching patterns. Uh, Tonight, I opted to wear a solid tie just so I wouldn't distract you. But I'm wearing a, I have eight of these gingham shirts in my closet because I think they're great to travel with. They don't show the wrinkles. And it's, uh, can I move a net or not? No. Uh, my suit's striped, my shirt's checked, my tie's solid. But typically, I'd be wearing a tie that was navy. And if I was wearing this color shoe, I'd have this rusty color in the tie, uh, maybe some olive with the navy. Um, Mr. Waring, would you be uncomfortable if I had you stand up or not? Yes. Oh, come on. <laughs> this is a new client of mine, and I think he looks fabulous. He's got a plaid jacket on. He is an impressive sized man. He's got a plaid shirt, and I, ta I told him to wear that outfit. Uh, when I made it for him, and how do you feel in it? Embarrassed. <laughs> Why? But you look fabulous. You really do. You look fabulous. Um, so that's mixing patterns there. I don't think you should ever be afraid. And if you try too hard, you've already blown it. It should make. Sh I mean, it's great to have something be slightly off. You know, it's really, really great to have something be slightly off. Um, do I see some single girls here that are not with guys? Okay, can I just ask why you're here? Seriously. I'm sorry, but I didn't hear you. She's not married, but she wants her boyfriend to dress nicely. So you're going to bring the information back to him? Oh, you are? God bless you. My cards are over here. <laughs> it doesn't translate as well when it comes to Okay, but I, uh, you know, but you know that you just brought that up. I want to bring something up. This whole casualness. I blame it on women, and I'll tell you why. I, 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 I in, a, in one way I do. So you spend the whole night getting ready in your little black dress, you know, and doing your makeup, and some guy shows up in flip-flops and ragged jeans and a t-shirt and you don't say I don't, I, I don't know how to do it but the uh-uh <laughs> no you didn't I don't know what it, you know you can't you can't let him take you out to dinner like that with a baseball cap on you tell him go home get dressed look what I did to look hot for you you're not getting any of this until you get <laughs> yourself together so I really think I blame women when they leave the house with their husband that has a wardrobe I Hundreds of suits. <laughs> no, really, right? I know you did. And he said, I'm too tired. He said, I'm going the way I am. Yeah. No, it's not a shame to dress up. Are we done? Any more questions? Uh, I'm here if you want me. Should I stop and just kind of mingle? Or? I was wondering about if you wanted to talk about the ascot. Oh. She wants me to talk about the ascot. 
Oh, I can keep, I can stretch. Can I yeah, I even brought some ascots. Does anybody here have, feel like, uh, can I walk around or not? Hold on, what, hunt? Oh, I don't agree with you. Is that what you said? Yes. If you're not Fred Astaire? Oh, stop. <laughs> the other night I went out, let's see. Oh, I had on a navy blue suit uh, with white pinstripes, and she's not even paying attention. She's texting. That's so, come on, stop, 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 stop. Okay, that's okay. Anyway, I took my, uh, I took my tie off, and I put on a navy and white paisley ascot. I went to Barolo to meet all my friends to have drinks. They're, they're Italian, but not everybody's Italian. The, the boys that own the place, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I can tell you right now that Mr. Waring is not from Naples, and if he had a little bit of silk around the neck there, it's like a turtleneck. Every man, regardless of his size, skinny, fat, in between, a turtleneck shaves years off your face. <laughs> I'm serious, and everybody looks great in a turtleneck. This young guy, he looks very British to me. I don't believe, are you British or not? No, my family was Norwegian. Norwegian. Norwegian, can even better, no. He looked great with it. If he was in a bar with an ascot on, you'd totally want to go out with him. I wouldn't, but I think, I think Cliff is kind of looking at you over here. Cliff, here. Oh, sorry. I'm politically uh, incorrect. Um, okay, so the ascot. She loves the ascot. I love the ascot. I have never felt comfortable wearing one up until the last few years. My buddies have been wearing them in New York for years. Uh, I love hats with a passion, and I cannot wear a hat. I have a collection of vintage Borsellinos, and the reason I don't wear them is because my wife says I look like a criminale when I wear a hat. And she's <laughs> absolutely right. I look like I just shot somebody. And, but I mean, I just, I they love hats. Anyway, so huh? They deserved it anyway. They deserved it, you're right, you're right. Uh, but yeah, you want me to stretch? Earlier, somebody over here had a question about accessories. I didn't yeah. Ascot, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Huh? Have I? Uh, I sell a lot. Braces. Uh, braces I love if you're wearing them to hold up your trousers and you don't have belt loops because it's kind of silly. Trousers never originally had belt loops until the Duke of Windsor, who you know the one that gave up the throne. Uh, decided he did not like high-rise trousers like the English war with braces and he used to have his trousers made in New York and his coats made in England or Italy and uh, he had he had belt loops put on so that's a very recent thing to wear your trousers down here so if you're gonna wear braces I, I think you shouldn't have belt loops on the trousers I know you're an expert. I don't mean to disagree with you, but I feel that it's it's uh, plain uh, nonchalant when you wear braces and have uh, belt loops. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> Can we call security, please? <laughs> I just about had it with this guy. No, I love him. Love him. Yes, ma'am. You know, uh, people always say to me when they're buying a suit. Should I have a vest made with that suit? I say, only if you're gonna wear it. It's expensive. It can add anywhere from eight hundred to thousands of dollars more, depending on the f price of the fabric, to make it a three-piece suit. I'd rather tell you to buy two pair of pants with the suit. Um, but if you're a woman. Oh, I love it. Yeah, because a woman would wear a three-piece suit. It's, Again, you're taking our clothes. <laughs> but it's totally rocking. You know, a woman, a woman pulls it off. You know, wears it without a shirt, you know, or what, you know, maybe a little color thing. Camisole? Is that the one? Like, straight guy, sorry. <laughs> anyway, vest. Yeah, I like it. If you're a woman. Can you buy what? The vest without the jacket. You can, sure. I like that. Remember uh, Diane Keaton and Annie Hall? Killer look. 
she's one hot babe too. Huh? Marlena Dietrich, fabulous, yeah. What are your favorite uh, rules to break? My favorite rules to break. I love slightly casual shoes with a really nice dressy business suit. I love no socks. I love velvet slippers with the suit with no socks. I love, um, I love to wear my green velvet jacket with green velvet slippers, no socks, and a pair of jeans. Uh, so that's typically, it makes me feel like Rod Stewart, you know, from the 70s. <laughs> or Mike when we were kids. <laughs> with our shag haircuts and our platform shoes. <laughs> but uh, uh, what else do I like? What rules do I like to break? Oh, I love button down collar shirts. Unbutton your collar. This is how Johnny Agnelli wore his button downs. He bought suits from Caraceni in Rome and Milan, double breasted flannels, a lot of three button and single button peak lapels. <laughs> Very similar. <laughs> but let me tell you, he would go into Brooks Brothers and buy 100 button down shirts in blue and white and he would put his tie on, but he'd never button them. And he would take his watch, and he'd wear it over his cuff so that he could see the tie. <laughs> so when you go to Italy now, every Italian guy looks like this with it undone. But isn't that the equivalent of wearing a Mont Blanc pen on the outside of your suit so everyone can tell you have a Mont Blanc pen? Well, I think, first of all, I'm, you're going to get mad at me now, but a, a properly made shirt never has a uh, a pocket on it. Oh, no. Yeah. Unless, you know, oh, I'm naked without my pocket. Okay, here's your freaking pocket. What, what we you give it to you. What do you want me to do with your iPhone? Well, you want me to, no. <laughs> I'll tell you what to do with your iPhone, no. Uh, where would you put it? Well, I put it where I put it. In my jacket. In my back pocket, which has a flap on it. I know. But anyway. Um, Can I button my collar again? No, it looks great. No, come on. No, it was always meant to. Oh, well, do you know why historically there are buttons? The collar is originally, God, that looks great. Um, the collar was originally called a polo collar. And um, the reason they put buttons on the collar was so that when you were playing polo, the, the collar did not come up in your face while you were playing polo. So the button-down collar is really called a polo collar. So. Can you, wear a, can you wear a French cuff casually? Or Everybody does it now. <laughs> and I don't see why you can't. Why not? Sure. I mean, young guys like to wear them with jeans. But that's great. And that's a rule you're breaking. I think it's a great rule to break. The food looks fabulous. Yes, dear. So, I, I, please excuse me if this sounds rude. So your tie seems short compared to what I Yes, doing. absolutely, on purpose. <laughs> You're not rude. <laughs> no, it is. Yeah, if it's... It's intentionally short. It is intentionally short, yeah. It should, well, I am wearing very short rise trousers, but if you go to Italy, they even wear them up here. And they uh, purposely might even do this. Is that sort of a nonchalant look? It is. Please, everyone, don't feel that you have to wait for the rest of us. If your food comes, take advantage. Yeah, and, and, and please don't be offended if I eat off your plate because I'm really hungry. <laughs> Where is your shop? My shop, how come you don't know? That's why I'm here. <laughs> I'm on the corner of First and Lenora in Belltown. Been there since 1990. I have what? Some beautiful pea coats for sale. I do have some beautiful pea coats for sale. <laughs> Okay. So it looks like we're just going to wrap up for now and enjoy dinner. John has all kinds of visual aids up here if you want to come check them out. Sure. Later. Oh, man, that looks great.